This is a production of Cornell University. Welcome everyone. Um, my name is Kirsten Kurtz. I am a soil scientist at Cornell University. So as Penny said, part of that role is managing the health laboratory. Um, I'm also a graduate student at Cornell in the Department of Natural Resources. <clears throat> and I am known for my soil painting work. I included um, one of my soil paintings here on the screen. Um, my undergrad is in fine art and I hold a lot of interest in communication. So this is part of what I do. I do have um, contact information up here. You should feel free to reach out to me directly if you would like to. All right, so I want to start by talking about um, why I love soil and why soil is so important to me. It's important to understand that 95% of the world's food comes from soil. So I'm often asked if hydroponics or something like that could replace this, and the short answer is no. You basically just need to think about all the grains that we eat, the meat, and dairy that many of us subside on, and you can see that this isn't a realistic solution. And of this soil, we've lost a third, according to the FAO, of the arable soil on the planet. Along with that, we've lost 50 to 70% of the soil carbon stock. I'm sure you guys have heard a lot about soil carbon. I'm going to talk about soil carbon quite a bit today. Um, we know that soil stores more carbon than the atmosphere and plant life combined. So it's very important that we hold as much soil as possible, um, carbon in that soil as possible. We also know that without change, and by that I mean without a move to a more sustainable agricultural system, we've got about 60 harvests left. All right, so I know that this is really depressing, but I really need to kind of explain why I care so much about soil and why I think that this is such an important thing to study and to work on the improvement of. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some um, kind of basics and soil soil science just to uh, build a foundation for the talks that I'm going to give about our lab. So one of the most important things about soil is aggregates. So aggregates are those little crumbs of soil that you can see in a healthy soil system. You can see some pictures here on the screen being held by the hand. And those little aggregates are held to together by root and worm exodus, which is basically the slime that comes off of roots and comes off of worms, and that helps to hold those aggregates together. And a lot of the life of the soil happens within the aggregates. So that's part of the reason why they're so important. And then around those aggregates is space, which is also incredibly important because that's where the water and the gases are moving through the system. It's very important to not have a compacted system because we know that this life is primarily living inside the aggregates and so much of the nutrient uh, movement, the water movement, and those things are controlled by that space. So we can see here that soil is about half solid and about half water and gases, um, which is really important for understanding the way that we look at soil health. Um, so many of you may have heard, it's kind of a cliche within soil science at this point, but it's true that there are more organisms in a teaspoon of soil than there are people on the planet. By this, I'm talking about a healthy soil, but and of those organisms, we really are just starting to um, scratch the surface and understand what these different organisms do. And when I'm talking about soil organisms, I'm talking about microbes, bacteria, and fungi. And these hold a lot of really important roles within the soil system and within soil health, including that they decompose organic matter. And through that, they're increasing the nutrient availability and storage within your soil. We also know that having a healthy microbial community helps to protect your plants against pathogens. So your plant is more likely to be able to uh, push through maybe a disease or something like that if it's in a healthy system. And we also know that a healthy soil has increased aggregation and pore space, 
which is really what I was talking about on that previous slide. <clears throat> All right, so organic matter is obviously a really important part of soil health. Um, and one of the things that I think is important to understand about organic matter is that all organic matter is not the same. So we say in soil science, the living, the dead, and the very dead, right? And those are all um, different properties of these organic matters. So what I'm talking about is the living would be um, compost, the actual biomass of the bodies of the microbes themselves. It's things, um, organic matter that can be quickly cycled through the system. Um, when I'm talking about the dead, I'm talking about a more stable organic matter. I'm gonna talk a lot about this active organic matter, which is what we call the dead organic matter today. We measure that in many different ways. And then of course, there's also the very dead, which um, is also referred to as humus, um, and this is basically that really carbonaceous material in your soil that's very, very stable and it's hard to lose. So organic matter is typically one to 6% of a total soil mass. I know um, some of you guys are landscapers or have these um, botanic gardens, things like that. You might see way higher levels of organic matter in those types of systems. I'm really talking, at least with this slide, sort of about more of a corn soy rotation typical ag system. Um, and the soil organic matter has really important functions within the soil. Most importantly, in my opinion, would be the nutrient storage, as well as improving that soil structure and decreasing erosion. So having good organic matter levels in your soil is actually going to help um, make your aggregates that I showed you a couple slides ago more stable. All right, so with this, I'm going to move into soil health. So the NRCS defines soil health as the continued capacity of soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. Um, this sustaining, I feel, is the really key part of this definition, as well as the vital living ecosystem. It took a long time for soil scientists to understand that soil is indeed a living ecosystem. And when people talk about soil health, what they're really talking about is looking at the chemical aspects of soil, nutrients, pH, things that everyone's very familiar with along with the biological and the physical aspects of soil. And we look at them together in a holistic way. So talking about biological aspects, that's basically gonna be biota, the life of the soil, carbon, organic matter. Physical is gonna be that structure of the soil and the texture. All right, so I wanted to give you guys just a very brief overview of kind of who we are at the Cornell Soil Health Lab. Um, we developed the CASH test, which some of you may have heard of. Um, we opened this lab in 2007. It was the first um, soil health test in the world, to my knowledge. At this point, we've tested over 10,000 samples, and we do accept samples from around the world. And we use that information to not only report to our clients what their results are, of course, but also to build this gigantic global soil health database. And this helps us to understand where your results, for instance, fall in against all of the other results that we've received in our lab. Um, we also do a lot of work in research, outreach and education. Um, we've developed many of the tests ourselves um, and we also go and talk all over the place, including this talk today, to try to uh, expand the knowledge and interest in soil health. So I've included our website here. We have a really gigantic website with just masses of information, but worth noting is that our book is there for a free download. We also have fact sheets, which really, really simplify these concepts that could be useful um, for you or the people that you work with. So when we wanted to um, develop the Cornell Soil Health Test, and I should mention this whole project was led by Harold Van Ness, a professor at Cornell and former president of the Soil Science Society of America, among other, um, among other interesting and impressive qualities. 
he basically was looking for things that were very sensitive to management. This is one of the key things about the way that we look at soil health. So we're able to uh, differentiate, for instance, the difference between a plow till field and a no till field through um, these different tests. So it had to be sensitive to management. It also needed to be um, affordable and easy to replicate. So we looked at, I believe, originally 64 different soil health properties. And then we distilled it down to this list, which um, I will say is always kind of changing. For instance, this year we added total carbon, total nitrogen. Um, additionally, in the biological aspects, and you can see we look at a lot of biological aspects in our lab, we look at organic matter, we look at soil protein, we look at soil respiration, and we look at active carbon. Um, on the physical aspect, we're looking at texture, we're looking at aggregate stability, and we're looking at surface and subsurface hardness or compaction. And then in the chemical, we're looking at pH and your major and minor nutrients. Uh, it's useful to think about the chemical aspect of our testing is really similar to what you would get from a typical soil test that you could get from pretty much anywhere, would be that chemical aspect plus organic matter, typically. All right, so it's really important to have a question before you sample your soil. Um, we always recommend that you take two samples. This isn't because we're trying to make money, we're a not-for-profit and we're very busy. Um, this isn't the goal here. The goal is that we can tell you so much more and you can understand so much more about your soil with this concept, which we call comparison sampling. So in this case, you can see this sort of little um, map or whatever you want to call it with the zone X and the zone Y. And we're looking at the differences between no-till and plow-till. Now you'll see that there's kind of this W shape that goes across the field. This is um, the way that we recommend sampling. And we also recommend that you would avoid anything that's not representative of your field. So in this case, we have a low spot and we're avoiding that. But you could also think, you know, look across your area, and if you have really, really good yield and poor yield, you want to sample that mid-range yield, right, so that you can really get um, an honest answer about what you're looking at within your soil. Anyway, each one of these points, what we do is we take a subsample. At the end of taking all of these subsamples, we mix them very well, and then we pull out a composite sample that gets sent to our lab. We also take penetrometer readings at each point that we sample, and I'll talk about what that means a little bit later. Um, but yeah, I do have to just kind of make a plug for having a question and not just sending in one sample. Another way to use this would be to look at something that's never been managed versus something that has been managed. There's a lot of different questions you could ask with this approach. All right, so I'm gonna begin by talking about our biological indicators, uh, quite simply the life of the soil. And I have them listed again here. And I also just have to give a shout out to my favorite soil microbe, which is the tardigrade, which is all the way at the bottom on the left. This is also known as a water bear. And what's so amazing about this creature is it can actually be frozen for thousands of years, thaw out, and it's totally fine. It can survive in space. It can survive um, radiation. It's really amazing, and it's just one example of the millions, probably billions, of soil microbes that we're really just starting to understand. All right, so I'm going to start with soil organic matter. Um, we measure soil organic matter in our lab using loss on ignition, which is really simple and it's the way that everyone has been looking at soil organic matter uh, for as long as I, you know, I don't think there's any other real way to look at soil organic matter beyond this. So basically what we do is, you know, you take your soil, you weigh it, and then you simply burn off everything that can be burned off at 500 C. So this is that living, dying, dead that I was talking about earlier. Then that number can be reported as percentage LOI, which some scientists use, or for your percentage of organic matter, we apply this equation and we're able to report your percentage organic matter. 
So it's very simple um, and it's exactly the same way that everyone does it. All right, so we also look at soil protein in our lab. This is something that we developed ourselves. This test is commonly known as the ACE protein test. Also, the NRCS is calling it bioavailable nitrogen. And this is a really good way to think about soil protein. So there's a lot of different types of soil proteins and protein like substances in the soil. These are typically derived from plant residues, majorly derived from plant residues. And the way to think about this is it's a way to get out at the amount of bioavailable nitrogen, which is available in your organic matter, right? So this is the nitrogen that can be easily um, uptaked by that um, by the microbial community and then released, mineralized for the plant uptake. And you can see here when I was talking earlier about the dying living dead, um, and I was talking about the active, so that was the um, yeah, living dying section, you can see here that that includes the soil protein. All right, so then I'm just going to, um, along with this, talk about how we actually measure this in the lab. Um, this is by far our most complicated soil health test. Uh, but basically what we do is that we extract the aggregates from the soil using a sodium citrate buffer. We then take this solution and we autoclave it, and then we pipette out two mils um, of this slurry, which is then centrifuged. The centrifuged slurry is then um, removed and put into these little plates that you see here on the screen. And we're able, through adding the Thermo Pierce BCA protein assay, it actually changes the color in according to how much protein is in it. And then we're able to read for this cover with a spectrophotometric plate reader. Um, and it's a very strong indicator. Quite a few other labs have started um, doing this as well. All right, so we also look at soil respiration. Um, soil respiration, I think the best way to think about that is as a proxy for the metabolic activity of your soil microbial community. All right, so it's not really a way to think about abundance of soil microbes. It's more a way to look at how active they are. But of course, if you have more, it might be more active, but it might not. So I think um, everyone here probably knows that these uh, soil microbes basically breathe out CO2. It's a part of the carbon cycle. Um, and this is what we're getting at and what we're really looking at when we're trying to look at soil respiration. So some folks um, do a one day respiration. We actually do a four day respiration. Um, the reason for this is that when you first sort of wake up the microbes, and I'll show you guys how we do that on the next slide, um, we know that there's this big burst of activity. And that activity could then drop super quickly or it could kind of slowly drop or stay up around there. So we feel that if we're looking at that respiration just for one day, we could have kind of an artificial idea of how active that soil is. Whereas if we look over four days, we get, in our opinion, a more realistic idea of that metabolic activity. All right, so for this soil, what we do is we take a known weight of air-dried soil. And I should mention here that basically all of our tests use air-dried soil. Um, this is something that's a little bit different from some other soil labs. And this is because we're really trying to get at that life of the soil. So we put this soil on this little aluminum weigh boat that's got holes poked in the middle and we pipette in a known um, amount of water, which kind of slowly wakes those microbes up through um, slowly wetting the soil back up, which has been air dried. We then put a little um, capture beaker in there of potassium hydroxide, commonly known as KOH, and we seal the jar for four days. 
at the end of this four days, we open up the jar and we measure the conductivity of that KOH. And from that, we're able to determine the total captured CO2. And then these results are reported in milligrams of CO2 per, per gram of dry, wet soil. We also um, look at active carbon in our lab. This test was developed by Ray Weil. Um, he is one of the leading soil scientists in the world. He wrote The Nature and Properties of Soils, along with Brady, um, which is kind of the Bible of soil science for all of us. And active carbon is a really great test. It's super replicable. And what's really cool about it is you can actually do this in the field with your client. So I'll show you on the next slide. We measure this with a pocket colorimeter. Um, but point being, you could do this in real time in a field and really get to show someone their active carbon right on the spot. And active carbon is kind of similar to the ACE protein test that I was talking about. And again, that we're looking at um, part of the soil organic matter. But in this case, it's carbon, of course, and it's the carbon that can serve as a readily available food and energy source for the soil microbial community. So again, it's, it's very easy for them to access and then to release those nutrients to the plants and to the soil system. Um, so the way that we do this, and this is the way that everyone does active carbon, many labs do active carbon as they should, it's a great test. <clears throat> But we take, again, air-dried soil, a known weight, <clears throat> and we add potassium permagnate. And potassium permagnate is very, very dark purple. And what's so interesting about it is that it actually bleaches out the more carbon that you have. So if you recall my previous slide where you could kind of see um, a range of colors, the lighter um, the solution, the higher active carbon. So it's a little bit counterintuitive. It's a very simple test. Um, we basically add the potassium permagnate, we shake it for two minutes, we let it settle and then stop the um, solution from changing. At this point, it's bleached out the solution and then we read it with this pocket colorimeter. And this is what I was talking about with why it would be so easy to do this in the field. I know Ray Weil does it in the field. And um, we report this as parts per million. All right, so I know this slide's a little bit busy and wordy. Um, this is our newest test, so I kind of shoved a lot more information into these, this slide and the next one than I usually do. <clears throat> but I wanna talk about these because it's really important. Not only the carbon-nitrogen ratio, we know that that's super important, but looking, getting at your total carbon and your total nitrogen is very important. It's hard to measure nitrogen, as I'm sure you guys know, partially because there's so many different forms. So it's very valuable to understand what your total is. So the total carbon in this case is we're measuring the organic forms of carbon. So that's like the organic matter that I was talking about, but we're also measuring the inorganic forms of carbon in the soil. And by this, I mean carbonates, right? So this is a really important thing to kind of keep in mind. If you had a sample from say, um, the tall grass prairie region, which happens to be where I do my research, there's masses of carbonates um, in that soil system. So you would have to really look at your organic matter and look at the total carbon and kind of keep in mind that you're also burning off other carbonaceous materials. Um, and then the total nitrogen is basically exactly what it sounds like, is that we're getting at you know, that total number in all of these different forms. You know, there's the NO3, NH4, and all of these different forms we're able to get at that overall number with this test. And the way that we measure this in our lab is using this um, very new cutting edge piece of equipment that was developed by Scalar. So the way that this works is that we put a soil sample in a little crucible, which are those glass containers you can see on top of the slide. And then it goes on that little carousel. And then this apparatus will reach out, grab just one soil sample and pull it in and subject it to different levels of heat. 
So when we're looking at the total carbon, um, we do a complete oxidation of that carbon to CO2 at 1100 C. So this is obviously extremely, extremely hot. And then we're able to measure that CO2 using a non-dispersive infrared detection. Um, and then this same piece of equipment and off of that same sample is able to determine our total nitrogen. Um, the total nitrogen is determined using the DUMAS methodology. This has been around for a long time. Um, but basically what it does <clears throat> is it pulls the sample in and it converts all of the nitrogen using oxygen to N2. This N2 is then measured by um, thermo, thermal conductivity detection. And from that, we're able to report your total carbon and total nitrogen. Um, I will add that this is a very standard um, way to look at total carbon and total nitrogen, specifically in Europe, where there's a lot of interest in sequestering carbon in soil and being able to report how much um, carbon you've sequestered in, so sequestered in soil. Um, but to my knowledge, we are the third lab in the United States to own one of these um, pieces of equipment. They're very expensive and specialized. All right, so with that, I'm going to move into the physical indicators. Um, and this, many of these are inherent soil um, properties with the exception of aggregate stability and the surface and subsurface hardness. And we'll kind of get into what that really means. All right, so this is back to aggregates, which is really how I started this talk today. And um, these pictures here are actually from my research in the tall grass prairie region in Nebraska. So there are some very small um, remnant prairies that still exist throughout the American Midwest that have never been uh, tilled or cultivated. Um, the only management that they've had would be burning and grazing and not all of them even had that. And I'm extremely interested in what soil was like before the advent of industrial agriculture. So for this purpose, I, and for my research, I went out and I sampled these tall grass prairie regions. And as you might imagine, they have some of the highest soil health scores we've ever seen in our lab. But without sampling something else, without that comparison sampling that I really believe in so much, it's really hard to estimate how much the soil has changed. So for that reason, I also sampled directly adjacent active corn and soy rotation fields. So this um, soil that you see in the middle of the screen here, that is the active ag land. Most of these um, places have never even used cover crops because the soil is just so good. And it's also worth mentioning that this farmer had yields that were much higher than what is average for Nebraska. And you can see here, I think visually easily, how much modern agriculture, if it's not done in a sustainable way, can really destroy those aggregates and destroy that soil system. So back to the lab, aggregate stability is really um, gets at how stable those aggregates are when they are rained upon. You could also lose aggregates through wind. There's other ways to lose aggregates, but that rain is typically something that's really gonna start to break them apart. And the way that we do this in the lab is through putting um, this known weight of soil on these sieves. Now, I will stop here and say that you can see, I think these three sieves that have uh, very little soil on them, and then the other one that has quite a bit of soil on it, and these are actually from my research in Nebraska. And um, the ones that have very little soil are, of course, the ag soil. And you can see how um, fragile those aggregates are when compared to the one that still has so much soil there, which is, of course, from my remnant prairie um, sites. So management is a big deal. Now, the way that we look 
at aggregate stability um, in our lab is that first we remove any aggregates under 0.25 millimeters. Um, we then take the stable aggregates, which would be above 0.25 millimeters and below two millimeters, and we um, sprinkle them on these sieves in an even thin layer. We then weigh that soil and then we put it in these funnels. Underneath the funnel, there's a filter that's catching um, any aggregates that are failing and going through that sieve. So we then subject it to a very extreme um, rainstorm. It's about a six inch an hour rainstorm, which used to be really extreme. This is something that we see more and more. Um, also why it's so important to focus on aggregate stability. And at the end of that time, after exactly five minutes, we pull off those sieves with the soil and then we force any other aggregates to fail using water and simply the pressure of our hand. Um, so then what we have remaining on the sieve would just be stone, sand, things that cannot, you know, not aggregates, but cannot fail. We have our original weight. We have the weight of what did fail, what did not fail. And from that other number, we're able to report your percentage of aggregate stability. Um, and I have included the equation that we use for that. All right, so we also look at soil texture in our lab. And when soil scientists are talking about soil texture, what we're really talking about is your percentage of sand, silt, and clay. And I think that you can see here um, this textural triangle. I'm not sure if any of you have seen this before, but the way that this works is that you work down the sides with your percentage of silt, your percentage of clay, and your percentage of sand. And from those numbers, you can determine um, your, what's commonly called as your soil texture. And by that, I mean silt loam, silty clay loam, sandy clay loam, et cetera. Um, it's important to understand that soil texture is really an inherent soil property, and it's extremely hard to change. The main reason that we're interested in soil texture is that we actually will interpret your results differently depending on what your soil texture is. So for instance, we know that a clay is going to have a very different aggregate stability than a sand. And that goes through on many of the things that we look at. So there are ways that you can improve and work with your soil. Let's say you have a, a real clayey soil. There's things that you can do. You can plant deep-rooted cover crops. You can incorporate a lot of organic matter but you should just understand that it's probably going to stay a clay. It's very, very, very hard to change. All right, so the way that we look at this in our lab is that we take, um, again, air-dried soil, a known weight of air-dried soil, and we shake it in a sodium hexametaphosphate solution. And what this really is is just a soap solution, kind of like Dawn soap. And if you imagine how they use Dawn to clean, again, sorry, kind of a depressing example, but to clean oil off of, you know, birds, if there's an oil spill, something like that, it's the same concept in that that soap solution helps to separate particles from each other. So we take um, the soap solution with the soil and we shake it in a shaker for exactly two hours. And over that time, the sand, silt, and clay particles separate from each other. So then what we do is we take that um, little tube of soil and soap solution and water and we send it through a very fine sieve that captures um, the fine sand and the coarser sand but lets the silt and the clay go through using water and I think you can see that in this picture here. So what we have on that sieve is the sand captured and in the beaker underneath we have our silt, clay, and water. So I don't know if any of you remember the Stokes Law from physics, but basically Stokes Law has to do with the speed that a particle is going to fall based on its size. And that is how this whole test is set up. So um, clay is much, much, much smaller than silt. 
So after two hours, all of the silt will settle within this beaker and the clay is still suspended, falling slowly within the water. So then we decant off the clay in the water and we rinse the silt, which is settled in the bottom of the beaker into a teared can. We also rinse the sand, which into a teared can. We dry them overnight at 105 C. And from that, we're able to report your texture. So again, it's similar to the ag stab in that, you know, we measure your sand, we measure your silt, the other number, that's your clay. Um, and this is a very strong test. Um, we call this the rapid soil texture test because some labs do texture analysis in a much more complicated and expensive way. Um, but we have found actually that our texture test is almost, I mean, it's off by a, you know, a percentage, if that, um, almost as accurate as the standard test, which is like $80 pretty much at any lab, and this is $20 in our lab. So it's, a, it's an easier way to get at this information. All right, so we also look at available water capacity in our lab. Excuse me, I'm gonna take a sip of water. All right, so available water capacity is really important and it's exactly like what it sounds like. It's how much water your soil can hold. And we look at two points of available water capacity. Um, the one point is field capacity and the other point is permanent wilting point. So field capacity is when your soil is completely saturated with water, but it's not free flowing underground due to gravity, right? So this is a completely saturated system, as much water as you, that soil can possibly hold, that's called field capacity. And the other end that we look at is called permanent wilting point. And what this means is it's when the soil is so incredibly dry that it's actually sucking water out of the plants themselves to the point that they can't come back from it and they die, permanent wilting point. It's very interesting to me to think about soil pulling water um, from plants. And you can imagine that's a phenomenal amount of pressure to do something like that. And then I just wanted to include a little bit of information about how um, this available water capacity is affected by your soil texture. And in this case, I included some information about different um, sands. So we can look here and we can see that a coarse sand holds very little water. And that makes a lot of sense, right? It's very logical. And then when we move to the other end to a fine sandy loam, we can see it holds much, much more water. And this is because of course, a loamy soil has the ability to hold that water. Um, it's worth mentioning that, you know, organic ma matter makes a big difference here also. So the more organic matter that you have, the more um, water you are gonna be able to hold also. I'm sure you guys have heard quite a bit about that. All right, so the way that we measure this in our lab is that we take, um, we have these two chambers that basically extract to these high levels of pressure. Um, and we use 10 kilopascals to extract to field capacity and 1500 kilopascals to extract to permanent wilting point. And pretty much how this works is that it's pulling water out of these samples. And once no more water is being pulled out at those pressures, we know it's done. So we take the soil, um, we put it on a ceramic plate that has a known porosity. Um, we uh, then put it in the chamber when it's um, equilibrated, we move it out, we weigh it, we put it in a 105 C oven, the next day we weigh it again, and from that we can report available water capacity. Okay, so we also look at this surface or subsurface hardness. I prefer to call this compaction. Um, and we do this using a penetrometer. So this is the only um, test that's actually done by the farmers themselves. And the way that we do this is we have this kind of little rod that gets pushed into the ground and it measures resistance in PSI. So we do lend this equipment out. We send them all over the country. We can't send them out of the country. 
Um, but we send them all over the country and then people are able to measure that resistance. What's really important to understand about this is that root growth is highly limited above 300 PSI. So we're really trying to find numbers under that. A lot of this compaction happens from traffic, on the field, among other things. Plowing causes a lot of compaction. And then there's also natural causes of compaction um, just through the glaciers moving through where I live or various issues. But um, it is nice to get out in the field and find those compaction layers. It's really important for um, addressing management. All right, and then as I mentioned, we also um, do the kind of typical soil test, which is the pH major and minor nutrients. Um, and I'm not gonna get too into this because it's, it's pretty basic information that we do in basically the same way as everyone else. All right, but from that, I wanna move into managing um, for soil health. So, it can get really confusing if you're thinking about managing for soil health. It depends on your system. Um, you know, it depends on what you're growing, et cetera. But, you know, I've been working with soil health now for almost 10 years with this lab, and I've been able to distill it down to really six basic concepts. All right, so this is this idea of feeding the underground herd, right? Which I really love this idea. Um, you know, if you think about the fact that soil is alive, it's this living system, there's so many different microbes, it makes sense that you need to feed those microbes, right? So some of the best ways to do that are through increasing organic matter. You can do this in lots of different ways. Um, it's pretty much never going to hurt your soil to increase your organic matter. It's also really important to have cover on your soil all the time. I understand this it's hard to do, but as much as you can keep your soil covered, the healthier your system will be. And you can do this through um, cover crops and through intercropping and all sorts of other methods. It's also really important to increase your diversity. Diversity is extremely important in soil just as it is in life. Um, we know that certain microbes are going to live with certain plants. So the more diverse um, cropping system you have, the more types of microbes that you're going to attract and the more resilient your system will be overall. It's also really important to control your traffic and to avoid driving on wet soil. Like you can compact your soil a phenomenal amount driving on it one time when it's wet. I understand we can't all choose when we get out in the field. That's just not how farming works. But if at all possible, you should really, really avoid getting on that soil at all if it's wet. And of course, you need to reduce tillage. So the average microbe moves about an inch in its life. And if you're taking microbes that live down at six inches and you're flipping them to the top, you can imagine that that's not really going to make for a happy microbe. All right, so on these ideas, I just wanted to kind of show you some ways that you can address this. Um, I kind of uh, tailored this towards the type of audience I think I'm speaking to today. But basically, you know, for the organic matter, you're going to integrate compost, mulch, you know what I mean? You don't want to farm naked. You can get perennials in there. You can get cover crops in there to keep that cover. You know, you can rotate these annuals. You can have diverse species selection you know, choose when to drive on your um, field and keep those disturbances to a minimum. And if you think about these really quite simple things in a certain way, complicated in other ways, you really are gonna be able to jumpstart your system. All right, so with that, I'm bringing it around to, and this is, I'm getting close to the end of my talk, so I was asked to tell you all in case you wanna type up any questions for me. Got a couple slides left. Anyway, but this is our soil health report, right? This is what you get um, if you send a soil sample to our lab. And in the case of these two reports, um, they were taken about 10 feet away from each other. The one on the left has been um, intensively cultivated. It's tilled multiple times a year. It has multiple um, species of plants put on it a year. And the one on the right-hand side of the screen is the grass directly outside the field. 
And our report is set up like a traffic light, red, orange, you've got major issues, yellow, you're kind of in the mid range, and the green means you're doing really well. And if you look at these reports, you can see it's broken into physical, biological, and chemical aspects of soil. And when you look at the one on the left, the intensive cultivation, we see that there's a lot of issues in the physical and biological parts of the soil. But when we look at the chemical aspects of the soil, it looks fine. And this is something we see all the time. And part of that reason is because people have been managing for the chemical aspects of their soil for at least 100 years, right? But we hadn't, we didn't understand how to look at these physical and biological issues. And this really shows you kind of like big picture what we're trying to get at here is that if you don't, you know, you could think if you just did a normal soil test on this left hand side, you would still not understand why your soil was not doing well. But when we start to get into this physical and biological, it becomes a lot more clear. All right, so this is actually the front page of an eight page soil health report. Um, and the end of that report, we talk about short and long term management. So we go through um, everything that we looked at, we write in the report, say what your result was. Um, and for the sake of ease of reading, I blew up the A soil protein index. And I, want, I really want you guys to see here is that we make these short and long term management suggestions. We do not make um, like recommendations. And part of this is because we work with so many different types of clients from all over the world that you, there really isn't just like a one thing fixes all for this, right? So we instead say, we hope that you can find something that you can use out of these lists of options in the short and long term. So the short term would be, you know, something that you could do immediately, right? Like adding organic matter, adding some more of a biomass, um, integrating cover crops. And then long term, it's gonna be more like reducing tillage, you know, think about rotating, maintaining your pH, things along those lines. Um, and I think this is really important because it shows like our respect um, to our clients and it shows that there are a lot of different ways to get at these issues. All right, so with that, um, again, I wanted to share my contact information, another one of my soil paintings here. Um, so if you're interested in that, I've got a website, I have a whole initiative based around soil painting and my communication efforts trying to get more people excited about soil. Um, again, our website and my Instagram, if anyone's interested, as well as my uh, contact email. And thank you so much. Oh, that was great. Thank you so much, Kirsten. We do have several questions from our audience. Can you explain what types of questions we should be submitting with a soil test? Yeah, totally. That's a great question. So you could be interested in like what your management has done to the soil, right? So that's kind of in the case of my research. I'm like what has this industrial ag been doing to, you know, some of the best soil in the country? And I was able to get at that through looking at these two different samples. You could also, you know, some of our clients will say, you know, we're growing, maybe they have a huge perennial garden and just a part of it isn't doing well. Then you would sample the part that isn't doing well and the part that is doing well. And we would see if we could get at what that, um, that, that issue is that's holding you back. If that makes sense. But really it could be any question, you know, you could say, what's the difference between my corn field and my soy field or my front yard, my backyard, Okay. whatever, but it'll give you just that much more information. Very good. Uh, what can be done to manage the soil to hold more water? Yeah, so that's going to have a lot to do with incorporating organic matter. Um, it's going to depend on what your soil texture is. And if you have a pure sand, you're not, you're not going to be able to really build up that um, water holding capacity too much just because of the nature of sand. Um, but you probably don't, you probably have something kind of in the middle, in which case, you know, integrating masses of organic matter um, is really going to help you 
with that. Also, you know, putting in like deep rooted cover crops is going to help um, your roots to be able to go down deeper and access, you know, perhaps even the water table. So that's an option. Um, and you could also keep cover on that soil to help it from drying out, which would else also help keep that water in the system. There's a lot of things that you could do. Um, I'd probably have to look at your specific soil type to answer exactly. Okay. And are some of these techniques that you're talking about also the same things that would maximize carbon storage? Uh, yeah, some of them are. I mean, okay, so like maximizing carbon storage, there's a lot of different ways that you can do that. So again, with like the deep rooted cover crops, that's a way to get like carbonaceous materials down deep into your system. Um, managing for healthy soil and keeping your soil healthy is going to help it hold the carbon there. Carbon is a cycle, as I'm sure you guys know, just like nitrogen is, right? So it's always going to be moving through the system and that's healthy. We want that. Um, but there's definitely ways to kind of keep it there if that's what you're interested in. Um, and a way to get at that would be looking at some of our carbon measurements. So looking at that total carbon, um, we usually recommend that people use our test every three to five years. There's researchers who use it every year, don't get me wrong. Um, but for probably your question, I would try to look at the carbon that you have in your soil, integrate some of these known management strategies um, for increasing carbon, and then measure it again to see if what you're doing is working. Again, it's all soil is different, so you're always going to have to kind of um, apply your management towards your soil. Not all soils have the same capacity to hold carbon. So it's going to depend. Okay, very good. Uh, what's the procedure to contact someone to borrow the soil compaction tool? Yep, so we have it. It's right on our website. Um, there's actually, let me think, I think it's on a little side thing on the website, kind of on, on the right hand side, but you can search our website too. It's called a penetrometer and there's a tab that says borrow a penetrometer. And we basically, I think that we lend them to people for four weeks and we ship it to you for free. And then we just ask that, you know, you pay to ship it back to us. And we do that. Um, we only really do that if somebody's like sending in a soil test because it goes, we're collecting information for the soil test. Right. But obviously, if we send it to you, use it for anything you want for a month and then send it back. Okay, very good. Uh, does commercially produced high temperature compost uh, contain all of the necessary living soil amendments? Um, short answer, no. Uh, so not all compost is, is created equal, right? It's good to some, our lab doesn't do this, but other labs do, you can send in for compost testing. I highly recommend that if you're like buying a bunch of compost for your, your farm or what have you, you should get a little bit from them, send it to a compost testing lab. And especially you're going to want to know what that carbon to nitrogen ratio is. Um, it might also be useful for you to know what your phosphorus levels are. Sometimes compost can have, especially if it is derived from manure, extremely high phosphorus levels, which is not really dangerous for um, your what you're growing in your system, but it is really bad for the environment. Um, so also to that question, like there's different, the microbes that live in compost aren't the same as the microbes that live in healthy soil. Right, so there's always gonna be these different systems um, and different types of microbes. And in general, you just wanna have kind of like as, as much diversity and abundance of, within that microbial community as possible. So I would think about analyzing your compost and also analyzing your soil, and then maybe even analyzing your soil after you add the compost and just really make sure that it, it is giving you what you think you need. I have seen problems um, with people adding too much compost. And basically what typically happens is that there's so much carbon, it actually ties up the nitrogen and then your um, crops aren't getting enough nitrogen to grow. Mm. So it's something to be aware of. Oh, good tip. 
Uh, can you recommend a resource, either book or website, that can explain many of these concepts in uh, a way that lay gardeners and farmers can find more approachable? Yeah, yeah, I understand this is this is complicated. Um, so, you know, I'm gonna, of course, start with our website and those fact sheets that I mentioned in the beginning. So we have a two page fact sheet for each, every one of these things that I talked about today that explains it in a much more simple way um, and explains the importance of texture, for instance, kind of in a similar way as how I presented this. And then it explains how we measure it. Um, there's also a good book, Building Soils for Better Crops. And we also have a uh, link for a free download for that on our website. And that was written by Harold Van Ness and Fred uh, Magdoff. And that's like a really nice kind of overview of the system. But to be um, honest, soil is incredibly complicated and that's just kind of how it is. But that said, I'm really happy to talk to people and answer questions. So I get contacted you know, weekly by people who want me to like help them understand their report or help them interpret, um, you know, the nature and properties of the soils at their property and things along those lines. Um, so, you know, you can reach out to people like me or extension associates where you live who probably through a conversation can really um, simplify these quite complicated concepts. Very good. That's that's helpful. Can you give us some examples of deep rooted cover crops? Yeah, definitely. Okay, so which is such a fair question, as I mentioned them multiple times. So one of my favorite deep rooted cover crops is the daikon um, or tillage radish. And I'm sure you guys all know daikon from eating it. It's big in like Japanese cuisine. Um, and what's so cool about daikon is that it breaks up compaction um, to really deep levels and they get quite big. So what you can do is you can, and I worked with this guy who had issues with his trees actually, I think it was like Christmas trees, and we worked together and he planted them in a circle around his trees. And indeed it broke up that compaction and allowed his tree roots to get down deeper into the system to access that water. So there's other types of deep rooted cover crops for sure. Um, if there's something specific, you could email me and I could try to find something that would work well for you if you don't think daikon will. But what's so cool about it is that it breaks down and it makes these channels for the water and the nutrients to come up and for drainage to go down. So I really recommend daikons for clayey soil, um, but Anybody with compaction, if you can get away with it, the only negative about daikon is that you leave it in the ground to rot, and I've heard that it smells quite disgusting. Um, and I know there was like some famous thing in New York recently where people were complaining about it and things like that. So that's kind of the only downside that I know about daikon. Um, but if it's possible to integrate it, that would be a lovely example of a deep rooted cover crop. Uh, what about deep rooted flowers or shrubs in to put in a shady site with clay soil? Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Definitely. And there's more and more information out there on these cover crops um, that have these, but then also anything deep rooted, right? And that's kind of an important thing to understand. And you can find this information out there you know, but is how far down are those roots going to go? You know, maybe if you're designing, let's say like a garden or something like that, a perennial garden, you know, you could have a variety of different types of rooted plants. I know that grasses um, have a lot of, there's a lot of really nice deep rooted grasses and that's a really great way to get um, carbon deep down into the system and to also help uh, break up that compaction a little bit. But yeah, it's kind of like what I was saying with the short and long-term management it's you know it's like these concepts you know so you guys have like kind of the basics okay these are the things we can do to improve soil health and then it's up to you and you know i'm happy to talk to other like extension people to kind of come up with a game plan to that will work for your system right i know a lot of you guys are like landscapers and stuff like that so 
you know, that's not 100% my field. So it's like, you're going to have to, you'll know more about what's deep rooted landscaping shrubs there are out there than me. Um, but definitely anything that's going to be like pushing down through that system is really going to help you. And um, I'm sure there's lots of options for you guys along those lines. Okay, great. There are a few questions about the use of wood chips and also uh, the debate about uh, using some kind of wood chips or mulch versus green mulch. If you could just give us a little on that, maybe how to convince people to use more green mulch. Okay, so I like wood chips. I'm a fan of wood chips, um, but they have a major issue, which is that they're you know really high in carbon. So you can throw off your carbon to nitrogen ratio, right? And then you're tying up your nitrogen. So if you want a reason to convince somebody not to use wood chips, that's what I would say personally. Um, and then say like, okay, with this green mulch system, What's really cool about that is then you're getting at um, kind of like different levels of how quickly it could break down, right? So like if you have a green mulch, then you're gonna have more of that living dying, whereas um, you know the wood chips are more like the dead, right? It's not really gonna give that much to your soil. It will break down slowly. It will kind of give you some more um, like pore space probably within your system. But yeah, I mean, if it was up to me, and I was looking at like wood chips versus um, a green manure or something along those lines, I would go green manure um, just because you're adding more life to the system, which in my opinion is gonna give you a stronger, uh, more resilient uh, system overall. So look at the carbon nitrogen ratio um, and that'll be how you can sell the green manure. Green oh, very good. Uh, do you know of any programs that are doing education on healthy soil at the community or state level? Um, yeah, I mean, lots of people, lots of people are. So like we are, of course, um, we're also involved with um, the New York Soil Health Program. So with that, we're looking right now at um, separating these soil health results by cropping system, by location, this is what we're gonna move into in the future. We're gonna have like kind of different results. If you're in California or if you're in New York, you would get kind of, it would be interpreted differently. Um, so we're working a lot on that, but there's basically people working on soil health in every state. Um, most of the land grant universities are probably working on soil health at some level. Um, there's the Soil Health Institute that we worked with a lot that's um, you know on a global, a global level, they're looking at soil health and they're starting to really um, look at the different tests, what's the best and, you know, get an idea of the health of our overall country. So they're doing a lot of stuff. The NRCS is doing a lot of work with um, soil health. The woman who's in charge of that, um, their director of soil health, used to be in our lab. She was one of um, our grad students. So of course I think she's good and she really is, she's very smart. Um, but there's soil health specialists with the NRCS in every state. They're actually hiring like big time right now for this um, because soil health has kind of finally been accepted by the scientific community as being valid. In the beginning, we had a lot of people kind of pushing back about this. But at this point, I think we're past that. So, yeah. So look at, into your NRCS. Look into um, your cooperative extension. Look into your land grant university. Be really careful that you look. Um, at like what these organizations are. It's just like researching anything. I, of course, I'm biased, but I'm more inclined to, you know, believe a university um, or the NRCS, which is part of the government, than, than maybe some of these other people who perhaps uh, aren't super well, as well trained or perhaps as knowledgeable as some of us who had to kind of go through a more formal education on this. Very good. Can you talk a little bit about how the use of Roundup or other chemicals affect the microbial community or other aspects of soil health? Um, yeah, so glyphosate, it's, I mean, it's a tricky question. 
there's a lot of politics tied to that question. Um, it's known that glyphosate hurts the microbial community. So definitely like farm fields that have had a lot of glyphosate on them have way lower levels of uh, microbial diversity. And from that, you could easily say that it's probably a lot less healthy. Um, the way that glyphosate works is it kind of binds up with other things in the soil system. Um, I think if it's being used properly, it is probably not um, that bad of an idea. But I think that there's a lot of people that are out there using it improperly. Like you can just buy it at Lowe's and you can spray it in your lawn. I mean, they are saying that it's a carcinogen potentially now. You know, it's kind of a it's kind of a uh, complicated question for me to answer just because I want to be kind of neutral on this subject. But basically, I'll say there's times that I think that it's an appropriate option. But in general, if you're interested in having a healthy system, I would recommend against using it. Um, regarding the exact microbial um, community stuff, there's a lot of people doing work on this now. I think sort of like a lot of the things with the microbial community were just scratching the surface. I'd say in another five years or so, you know, I can I could come in front of you guys and say, yes, it's definitely bad. This is exactly what it does. But right now, um, I, I think that's hard to say. Okay, thank you. Uh, in a community garden, uh, setting some of the uh, homeowners are using no-till and the question is how often should they be doing sampling to see how the cover cropping and no-till is comparing to surrounding plots that are using traditional tilling. Um, yep, so we recommend looking at your soil every three to five years. It takes time to build up soil health. It takes time to build up organic matter. Um, so I always recommend, if you can afford to, um, you should test your soil yearly for the major and minor nutrients, pH and organic matter, because the major and minor nutrients and pH you may need to adjust um, yearly depending on what you have going on in your system. And then if you look at your soil health, like every single year through our lab, you'll probably see it moving, but you might even see it go backwards one year. You know, oh no, my active carbon is lower than last year. And then you'll call me and you'll be all upset about it. And that's fine, but it's like basically, if you give it three years or five years, then you're really gonna be able to see big picture what's happening. Um, I always recommend taking like a benchmark establishment kind of sample before you start managing if that's at all possible um, but yeah no-till is really gonna help your soil I think that's one of the fastest ways that you can build up your soil health properties is by cutting out the tillage so I would expect that in three years you could probably see a difference and be able to report that and say look you know I have higher organic matter, I have higher functioning of my soil microbial community, and then you can really talk to that and, um, you know, kind of expand from there. Okay, very, very good. Well, we are running out of time, but we've had several questions about your fabulous soil paintings, and I wonder if you could just spend a few minutes telling us a little bit about that. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so I, as I mentioned, I think briefly, I have an undergrad in fine art. Um, I always felt, and then when I discovered soil and when I discovered soil science, it really like fit me well and I, I loved it. You know, I was like, okay, this is my career and I've been doing it ever since. Um, but I had a really hard time kind of understanding how I could be an artist and a scientist at the same time. I always grew up thinking that scientists were kind of like engineering types, which I'm very much not. Um, so I have a great passion for in, for uh, encouraging creativity within science, and I do a lot of work with that. Um, so with the soil painting, I basically uh, was taking this painting class with a, an acrylic painting class with this woman, Kim Schrag, and I really didn't like the colors of the acrylic paint. So I asked her if I could try to create my own paint from soil as I saw all these beautiful colors of soil coming in through the lab. Um, and she said I could, 
and then I developed my own method for making soil paint with it. Um, I use this primarily as a way to get people interested in soil and as a communication tool. Um, and indeed, it's really worked like that. I was just featured in The Furrow, which is the John Deere magazine this summer. Um, I led a team to win an international soil painting prize um, contest that was sponsored by the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization. I've had a couple documentaries made about this. Um, so it's really taken off and it's really it's been really cool and really exciting for me especially because i can like find a way to be creative within my position and um also it's totally sustainable so people send us in typically about six cups of soil we don't really need that much um we only need that if like one of the tests fail you know and our qc fails then we need to like rerun it so typically there's extra soil left over which would basically just get landfilled so instead of it being landfilled, I pull out, obviously not all of it, um, but I pull out cool colors and I save it and I've got a closet in my office filled with soil, actually, um, that I then can use to paint. And I do these live. So I'll go, um, this one I did at a reggae festival of all things, and I painted it live um, in the course of about, I think it was five hours with this other woman, actually, Julie Rosa, who I um brought in to help me do it and then while i'm doing that i'm like asking answering questions about soil and just sort of trying to get people excited about soil instead of formally teaching soil science like more like what i was doing with you guys here today so it's just kind of a new different way to communicate um and it's fun i do commissions you know i sell these i did not think i'd ever make money with my art degree so that's definitely at least one good takeaway but yeah it's fun thank you for asking about it and i have them all on my soilpainting.com and on my instagram is mostly focused on my soil painting work so that's fascinating one follow-up question is are they um stable enough that you can actually hang them and have a lasting piece of art yeah, totally. So the way that I make them is I take two millimeter um, sieve soil and I mix it with gesso, which is gypsum, um, clear gesso and water. So it's kind of like I'm making um, concrete, actually, and it's extremely stable. So the first series that I did, um, I never even sealed them. So I seal these all with this like really high quality museum level varnish that just keeps it all attached there. But my the first series that I did, I didn't seal for, I don't know, six years or something like that, and they were fine. Um, it's, I very slowly build them up. So this painting you see here on the screen, that's probably about six layers of soil. So it's like I paint, you know, a layer of soil, it has to dry completely, and then I come in again. So I think because of my slow building up um, style, that helps to make them more stable. And then um, the Three Sisters in Soil, which was on my first slide, that was the one that we that we won the big contest with, that's framed under glass um, at Cornell. And we actually left this little spacer at the bottom thinking, because I didn't know, I mean, I, I developed this, I didn't know if it was gonna work or not, um, thinking that maybe some soil would fall down and we kind of set it up in a shadow box so it would hide it. And not a single piece of soil has fallen off. So. Um, I think, I do believe that it's quite stable. Oh, this is, this is so interesting. Well, thank you, Kirsten, so much for sharing the scientific side as well as your artistic side. We've really enjoyed both. So thank you for sharing. Thank you so much, Penny. I really enjoyed this and I really appreciate all of your interest in soil health. It's really, it's really important. And I'm always excited to work with, uh, different types of audiences on this. So again, don't don't be shy. You can totally email me and I will email you back. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.